Okay, well, hi. Uh, we're back in with economic analysis for business, and this time we're going to be doing value added. Now, value added is, uh, when you think about economics, you would think that value is one of the things that must be at the beginning of every book. It must be done in great depth because what else is economics about other than the value? And the surprising thing is that it turns out that value is almost never discussed in economic classes, and particularly in the first year, because it is so difficult. Um, it just is, strangely enough, one of the difficult ideas in economics, and it is very hard, typically, to get it simple. So, first we're going to look at the slide says, the aim of economic activity. What is it about? What is the aim? Why do we do it? And the aim, as we say in a kind of abstract way, is to create value. Now, the thing about saying we're trying to create value is knowing what value is. What is valuable? How do you create it? Where does it come from? So that what we say is that something is valuable to the extent that a person is better off with it than without it. Either one of for two reasons. Either because they want it personally for themselves, it's something they desire and it gives them satisfaction, or secondly, it is something they can use in the production process to produce something else. So something is valuable as an input into producing some other good or service. But it's always in all cases, um, to obtain something as value, it is first necessary to give up something of value. Nothing comes from nothing, and there is nothing free out there. So what if we're going to create value, other valuable goods and services must be used up. Now, as it says, ways in which products are valuable. So again, I reiterate this. A product is valuable because it is something that satisfies a personal desire. Or it is desirable as a good or a service because it can be used to produce something else. Now that's the whole point, that something has value either because it is intrinsically valuable or it is valuable because it can be used in the production process. Now value creation requires human effort. This is the next slide and it's very important to appreciate that. Every good or service, if it is to be productive for human needs, must first be transformed before it can be used. Things just don't come naturally, are not just naturally available. You can say, well, there's an apple on a tree, but really there may be an apple over there on some tree and there may be a person over there who would like to eat that apple, but somehow the apple must be plucked off the tree and transported from that orchard over to where that person wants to, to sit down and have an apple. So that Nothing in the economy really is just where you want, when you want it. Everything has some kind of human transformation process involved. And so everything produced requires time, it requires effort, it requires natural resources, it requires capital, and each of these has a cost. They do not come free. Every single input into the production process has a cost. They are valuable resources that are being used up. Now, a free good is a good for which no other resources um, have to be drawn down so the good can be obtained. And it's just like air. We used to talk about air is free. And even now, we don't talk about air is free because now when we think of air, we think about clean air. And clean air is definitely not something that's free. You have to do something to ensure that the air around you that you breathe is clean and there's plenty of costs involved in making sure that those kinds of pollutants that might come into the air are not, not generated, not there. And so even something that we used to say free air is not free. And if it's air isn't free, I can tell you that there is nothing free. Every single desirable object that we want for ourselves or is useful in the production process comes at a cost. Something else has to be given up. So, as it says in the next one, production means valuable inputs are used up. Now that's what goes on in a production process. Everything used, everything used as an input has value. And again, I say it, it's time, it's effort, it's capital, 
natural resources, all of these have value. And all of these have been used up if we're going to produce something. Production requires valuable inputs to become less valuable. So some things we use up totally, like coal. We put coal in the furnace, coal disappears. Or we use some kind of um, electricity or even labor time. The labor time has been used in one way and that labor time is gone and cannot have been used and cannot in the future be used because it is gone. That hour has disappeared. Um, so they used up. And sometimes it's just you have a machine and the machine depreciates, it's a bit of wear and tear. But one way or the other, all these resources are used up as part of the production process. Production requires valuable inputs to become less valuable. Um, wear and tear machinery, or their value to be disappear completely, like I said, with coal. The production process requires us to diminish our existing stock of product resources to produce something else. So we have some resources, we use them in some particular way, some of them disappear, some of them become less valuable, but, and that's the important thing, but, at the other end of that process, something else gets produced. So that's what the production process has done. So when value has been added, as it says in the next slide, firstly, there's been the use of resources to produce something so that value has been lost. We've used up the coal, we've used up the cloth, making a shirt, it's gone. But value occurs, value added occurs when the value of what has been produced is greater than the value of what has been used up in the production. I'll say that again. This is what value added is all about. There are resources, all of which have value in their, on their own, in themselves. And then there's something that gets produced using those resources. Value added, that is we've increased the value in the world if the value of what is produced is greater than the value of the resources that were used up. And now that is what value adding production is all about. That is what we're trying to do in the economy. So that, as it says in the next slide, value creation is about production. Value creation is concerned with the transformation. It's a transformation of one set of goods and services into a second set of goods and services through the production process. And again, it says value will have been added if, in this case, the total revenues, that is the total receipts, cover the total production costs. So that going from the cost of all those inputs, where they had to all be paid, we're now talking about how much did we pay for those resources. And then you think about how much you can get for selling whatever it was you produced. If the total value of your revenues is greater than your total cost, then value added, as we think of it in an economic sense, has been produced. That is, as long as those who buy the product are able to pay in total, all the individual individuals who buy the product and you collectively add them all up, are able to repay the equivalent of what it would require to replace all of the resources that were used up. If they're willing to pay that amount, then you can say that at least we, we, we we're a line ball. And if there's more left over after that, then you can say that value has been added in the production process. Now, value is also, as it says in the next slide, it says value also created in producing inputs. So that the whole production process is not just devoted to producing only those final consumer goods. Along the way, we also have to be producing all those inputs. And so, when you are thinking about the final goods and services that have get produced, you also have to recognize that all the way along the line, there were all of these inputs that were being produced at the same time or in prior periods, so that the final consumer goods could be produced so that they could be produced, you also had to produce the inputs, and all those inputs had inputs of their own. But in the final analysis, it is only, it is only if the final goods and services themselves create enough revenue stream 
to purchase all of the inputs and to repay all the producers of the inputs for having got the inputs into their own production process. If at the final end, all of this is, all of this is paid for through the, the, the revenue stream of the final consumers, then you have a, um, a value, you have a situation where value has been added. So, you know, as it says in one of these slides, iron ore might be used to produce steel which is then used to produce factories, which are then used to produce product products that are bought by final consumers. So all along the line, it's not just you paid enough for the, uh, for the product using the steel, you have to make sure that the steel manufacturer also received enough to compensate them for having produced the steel. And then before that, all the miners who produce the iron to produce the steel, they also must be compensated so that the entire network of purchase and sale leading up to the final consumption of the good, everybody has to be compensated, everybody has to be making a profit because only if all of them are making a profit will not only the, 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 the final product be continue to be produced, but the inputs needed to make that final product will also continue to be produced. So I have an example here, which I just have the heading, wood, nails, hammer, and saw. Okay, so here's what it value added. It's very simple. I own wood and I own nails. I have wood and I have nails. I have a hammer, I have, some, I have a saw, and I have time. And what I do is I take the wood and I use the hammer and the saw and the nails and I bang together and I produce a table. And what I say is this, that value has been added if the value of the table at the end of this process is greater than the value of the inputs that went into it, value that's greater value than the, than the nails and the wood that got used up and the hammer and the saw, the depreciation and the time I used, if the final value of that table is greater than the value of those inputs, then you say value has been added during this process. Now, similarly, I use a, um, a bit more industrialized example that you see. I call it cloth thread dies and buttons. Cloth thread dies and buttons. Now look, a shirt. We're talking here about a shirt. A shirt at some stage was nothing more than cloth thread dies, buttons, just sitting there, there's a bolt of cloth, some thread in the spool. There are buttons in a pile, you know, they may have dyes that are used to, to dye the cloth different colors, but they're just there in different places. And they're brought together. And if you have also, you've got sewing machines, you've got laborers, you have buildings in which the, the workers are found to work and the sewing machines are, are, are are housed and you have them bring them all together with the cloth and you bring them all together and the laborers and these and they sew and they produce in the end a shirt. Each of these inputs had value on their own. Whether it was the labor time or the cloth or the or the buttons or whatever, all of these had value on their own. Um, and at some time at an earlier date, each had been a mere set of inputs into the production process that they came out of. The cloth, for example, may at some stage have been cotton growing in a field um, before it went through the many different stages before it actually became a bolt of cloth. Um, but at all the way along the process, what has to be thought of is that there is going to be that shirt. And what value adding is about um, is that all of these different inputs into the shirt and in the various inputs into the various inputs and so on going backwards as far as you like, um, all could have been used in some different way and all had value in that they could have been used elsewhere to make something else. Or if you didn't want to have a shirt made of cotton, even the cotton didn't have to be produced and some, all the resources that went into Growing the cotton could have been used to produce something else. So as you understand, even going to those earlier stages, and we are not necessarily moving into less sophisticated stages because these can be very complex 
transportation involved, air travel, whatever. But the point about it is that all of these had value on their own, intrinsically. All of the inputs have value on their own. And so when we're talking about a production process, we're talking about value added. We're talking about using resources that already exist in some particular form, and we're talking about refashioning them in a different way so that ultimately some new product comes out of the production process, and that new product has, if we are going to have the kind of economy we want, that new product will have more value than the value of the inputs that were used up in production. So, as I said here, in value adding, add, value added in production costs, every one of the inputs used in the chain of production has to be paid at least as much to, to cover every one of the costs involved. They all have to be paid. If the costs are not covered, the inputs will not be produced. Ultimately, they simply stop being produced because somewhere down the line, no one is, someone is not being able to cover their costs. And if the inputs are not produced, the final products cannot be produced as well. So that at the end of this stage may be consumers, but all along the way, through the most remote stages of the production process, which might be, have taken place a year or so before, many miles from where anybody is, as far away as you can think of, that production process started and it, all the value adding took place as each stage there was more and more brought together until you could finally get the product that was sought at the very end of the process. So, how do we tell? That's what it says. How do we tell whether production was value adding? How can you tell? And there's only one thing, and there's only one thing that will allow you to tell that, and that is that the payment by those who buy the good or service um, in total are enough to pay in full the costs incurred in bringing the market all the inputs into the production of whatever it has been that was produced. So value added, as we do it, is a measure of the excess of revenue over costs. Always bearing in mind underneath it is that there's all these inputs being used up and then there's a the final product and the value of the final product must be greater than the value of the inputs that were used up because otherwise they won't, the production will not take place and we will not have that product that we desire um, in the world. Value add occurs when the total in receipts of producing and selling is greater than the value of the goods and services which had been devoted to the production of each and every product. So, this is very important again, I just kind of like summarizing this. Value must be destroyed before value is increased. You know, you see some product out there, say, oh look at this, we have product X. Here it is, isn't it wonderful? But you know, many products in the world have not repaid their costs. They have not actually Whatever the value of what was produced, that final product, it is not greater than the value of the inputs that were used up. So you have something in the world that was a result of a production process, but the value of that good, that product, is not necessarily greater than the value of the resources that were used up. So that in seeing some product, you must always remember, never forget that the product, sure, is there and that's great, but at the same time you have to remember that in producing that product, value had to have been destroyed. It had to have been used up so that that product could come into existence. So that if you bear that in mind, the value that had previously existed um, and all that value could have been used in many different ways, except that it was used in that one particular way, that the products you actually see in the world are the result of decisions to use our valuable resources in some particular way, and the aim and the hope is that the value of what is produced is greater than the value of the resources that have been used up. Now, 
Value added growth and stagnation. Now that's the next heading. In an economy that wishes to remain viable, that is, at least to stay as prosperous as it actually already is, all of that existing value that's being used to production, the process, must be repaid. If an economy does no more than repay, just exactly repay the value used up, that is an economy that stays exactly where it was. And we've seen that in history. There were some societies that stagnated. They were just the same level of production and consumption for hundreds of years. They just never changed. In an economy, however, um, if more value is created at the end of the process that existed before it began, then we are looking at an economy that is growing. That is what is actually meant by economic growth. It is a situation where the value of what is produced is greater than the value of what has been used up. And of course, it's also possible, and this happens and happens more frequently than you would like, but it certainly happens, and in many societies it was not unusual, that you'll end up with less being produced in the value than had been used in the that had been used up, your resources have been used up. So the outcome is actually a lower level of value. And in those kinds of economies, not only you're not staying where you were, you actually find your economy has stagnated. So the heading, value and community demands profitable businesses. This is how you know, this is how the strongest evidence you have that value-adding activity is taking place, they, is that the existence of profitable businesses is the evidence that resources were used, money was paid out, costs were incurred, but if profits were actually earned, then the value of the output has turned out to be greater than the value of the inputs used up. Beneath even this is the hidden assumption of business responding to the wishes of the community. This is what we assume, that when a business is selling, it is selling, if it's selling to consumers, it's selling to the final customers, and their desires are being met. And so we say that the entire economy is being oriented towards the desires and demands of consumers. And so beneath all of that, all the producers of inputs, they too are finding that their production is being geared towards the demands of consumers and it is the desire to make profits that only can ultimately be received through the demand by the final users of the products that, that you end up with, um, you end up with a value-adding economy and in that way you end up with a greater flow of those kinds of goods and services that give satisfaction um, to, uh, to, to, to the, those who live in the community. Now you see, of course, there are some things that are given by governments, free. There are free government services. Now, government services are often preferred. Because they are given away for free, they don't have an actual charge to the person who actually received whatever benefit it is so that you can have free in the sense that the person who received the services does not pay for the product right then and there um, with money coming out of their own pocket at that time. But government services are never free in any sense, in the economic sense, because resources are used up in the production process. They are not free, not economically free. They have actually had a cost of production. Government services cannot be free. They just cannot be free. Um, they are paid for in some other way, and usually through taxation and sometimes through debt and deficits. But one way or the other, the resources of the nation have been used in that particular way rather than some other particular way. Government services must draw down, and they do draw down on the resources of the nation. And whatever, however you may say this is really beneficial, it's a good thing or whatever, you must never actually think of them as genuinely free. They are not free. They come with a cost to the community. They come with a cost in resources used up. They come with a cost in all the alternatives that we might have had. And instead, you have these 
government services instead of what you might otherwise have had. It's all very well for government services to be produced by, for the community, but bear this in mind, that government services seldom add value. Now, they're often not even intended to add value in that sense. Um, some government service can, they do add value, but many things the governments do are just done for welfare reasons. They want to improve the, the situation for individuals. But in the economic sense, you couldn't do this forever because you are, build, you are, you are drawing down on the resources of the nation without replenishing them. So that you can say, we do these things, but they are not value adding. Um, but they're nevertheless, and it's, no, it's not necessarily a reason not to do something um, because it doesn't add value, but it must be borne in mind that it is an actual cost, and it is a cost that will be borne somewhere. And however much a government may say we wish to provide this and that to the community, it must always be borne in mind that these free goods offered by governments are in no actual sense free. They are simply subsidized through the taxpayer or in some other way and they may be received by those who get them without having to pay themselves for what they receive, but the actual situation is one that uh, um, no necessarily added value. But it also says, that it mentions in the next slide, that some government services do add value. That's, it's not to say that the Governments never add value. It's uh, many things that governments do add value, even if they're completely subsidized, they may add value. The cost to the community, um, say, just to use an example, that's, that's quite common, public transport. Governments subsidize public transport. Public transport runs at a loss in almost everywhere that you have public transport. But that's not necessarily evidence that no value has been added. There may well be the structured economy doesn't permit the total value provided by, by the public transport to be incorporated into the price. There are these situations. They are not all that common, but they certainly are um, common enough that governments do have a role in some circumstances in providing certain things as government services. Um, but most government services are not value-adding. Most government services are welfare-oriented. They draw down the community's resources. It requires, as a background for the community, the existence of all of this value-adding activity elsewhere to allow these welfare, these forms of welfare to occur. And as long as you remember that it is value-adding activity that allows the non-welfare, the non-value-adding welfare activities to take place, then you'll understand what must go on in the economy if you're going to have the so-called free government goods uh, available to the community. Now, as it says here, it just uh, welfare is value provided below cost to the receiver. Governments also provide welfare, age pensions, unemployments, Disability payments, mother's allowances, there's many examples of these. Um, there's no additional value added in the sense that those who receive actually are contributing something to our total stock of goods and services that are available. They are not. They are receiving without contributing. It's not, that is not of itself the reason not to do it, but you must always remember that there's only a limited ability for any community to do that because it is your value-adding activities that allow all of these, the, these welfare-type activities to take place. Now, the next heading is utility. Utility is the word that economists use to describe the benefits derived from the array of goods received you know, by, the final, by the final buyers of products. We say they have received utility. Now, the reason we use the word utility is because we don't want to say satisfaction. 
because it's not always satisfaction. People are not always gaining satisfaction by spending their money. If you have a, a, um, a, a, a toothache and somebody comes and pulls your tooth out, well, you get utility. You're not really better off for it, although maybe with your tooth gone you are better off. But the point about it is that we use a more neutral word. We just say that people are getting utility. They're getting some kind of benefit from, uh, from, from economic activity. And we describe it as the form of utility. Um, we don't want it to suggest that there's pleasure in it. We only want to suggest that there is some value to the person. And of course, it is, as it says, value added is subjective. It is to the person. It's not to the community in general. It is to the individual. The amounts paid out are in exchange for some good or service. The individual pays out themselves to buy something. Um, and they pay it out because they prefer whatever it is that they're spending their money on. They prefer that in place of having the money. Um, and so we say, well, why did they spend the money? Well, we say they did it because they were receiving utility. Now this is how do we know, as it asks, how do we know that utility has been increased? We say it because people have actually paid their own money. If they've paid their own money, then we say, we take that as the evidence that utility has actually been received. So that in an exchange economy, if people are producing and taking their money and buying other things, the fact that they take their own money and they buy other things we say there is no further evidence required to show that they have received utility as part of this economic exchange process because they have spent their own money and they have received something in return that they chose to have in return and it was their choice to determine what would end up. So as it says, there are three elements in a buying decision. You can have some particular good or service. Or you can have some other particular good or service. Or you can just keep your money. Which of these gives the greatest personal utility? Who is there to decide other than yourself? Who should, what, which of these alternatives is the best for you? So what we say in an econo economic environment is that you are the best judge. And as it says, this is value and consumer sovereignty. Sovereignty. Who's the boss around here? Using business profitability as a proximate measure of value added allows the commercial world to be shaped by the individual decision making of the entire community. So what goes on out there in terms of what gets produced and how much um, is determined by the collective decisions of all of us together in to determine the output, and they, we determine it together by deciding what we will buy with the money we have earned in producing for other people. And it is only in that kind of environment, it is, it is only in that kind of environment that, that you can say that the uh, consumer is sovereign, and we use that as a really important phrase the consumer sovereign, that is, the consumer is the boss who decides what actually gets produced in the economy. Now, of course, the consumer is only the kind of the ultimate judge, ultimate judge. Really, who is deciding what gets produced are the producers. They are trying to guess, they're trying to work out in their own minds what, if they produce it, other people would buy. So that, and I, this, is a, uh, this is a very complex sentence here, and I'll just read this and then explain what it means. Within the economy, at every moment in time, there is an actual, existing, deeply layered texture of economic relationships between all of its different producers and all the different buyers of everything that is being produced. So if you just think of your economy as those final goods you see in the retail outlets. That's missing it. Because behind all of those retail items, 
that are being bought by all of us. There are all the different producers underneath it who are making all of those inputs, all the steel producers and the leather producers and the food manufacturers, all these people underneath it who are there. And we are trying to shape into the leanest, most economically efficient structure of all of these producers so that our costs are kept to a minimum, so that the amount of resources we use in producing any individual item is kept to a minimum. And so there is behind the entire array of consumer and retail goods, there is the structure production made up of all of the different businesses producing all of the different inputs into the inputs into the inputs into the final products. And that entire array, that entire network of producers and, and uh, from one business to another is what is known as the structure of production. And it is the structure, the, the shape given to that structure production that is given by the value-adding activities of each of us individually. And again, I come back to this and I will come back to this time and again. All production is about the future. Every producer, when they're making a decision on what to produce, is not thinking about the present moment. They are thinking about what will be a month from now, six months from now, a year from now. But they are thinking about the future. They are not thinking about the present time. And they have a list of things they are wondering about. They are saying, well, what shall I do? What will people buy from me a year from now? And that determines all kinds of things in how they are going to go about their business. What capital will they install? Which workers should they hire? What skills should they develop? Um, what building should they rent? Um, each and every one of these decisions have to be made before anything can be decided at all. They have to sit down and make these decisions for themselves about what is going to be part of their production decision before they can actually, anybody out there can actually buy anything. So the production is going to come before the, before the, con, for before the consumption. And as it says, firms have many customers so that there is this entire shaping it goes on by all the many demanders of the inputs, not just one business, not just two. Many different businesses use steel for many different purposes. And they all, these different buyers of the inputs, they shape the direction of, of the economy way back in there into the mining industries, into other industries. And it is all of these firms together that are going to determine what will ultimately get produced. So if you're going to picture an economy in full, you cannot see it as a supplier supplying only a single product to a single, to a single person or one person buying or, a, or even a business just selling one product, but a business selling many products to many different buyers. And it's all of these overlapping, all these different groups that are overlapping, all these different purchases and sales that, that people who buy from you and buy from each other, they all selling back and forth so that if you are in the pulp and paper industry and you produce a pulp and paper that produces paper, well, the pulp and paper industry also buys paper because they use paper in their office works so that you end up with this tremendous network of everybody buying and selling to each other as inputs on the way towards that production of that final output. So that's how you have to think that everything is connected to everything else. It's not just simply single units and single monads that stand there by themselves, but you have to build from all the sales of all the producers and all the relationships between one firm and another and between firms and the final demanders and the end of the process, there is a very large intricate network in place that is difficult to picture but should be seen in its totality and to grasp some idea where the goods and services originally come from and how they get to us. So again, I come back to this structure production. There it is. It's again a heading that says structure production. 
An economy is a series of relationships. It's a series of relationships. It's not just one-to-one. -one. It's relationships with this fantastic network branching out across the entire economy. And it is a network that is forever changing under the shifts in demand that are continuous and ongoing. And the supply of new products that are continuously coming out. There was whatever was being produced last year, some of that's giving way and new things are coming out this year. And as they come into the market, new forms of production are also taking up that no one had ever heard of before. And so there is this continuous evolution in the structure production. And we find ourselves, our own living centers dependent on this continuous evolution in the structure production as businesses respond to the kinds of inputs required to satisfy the wishes and desires of we as buyers, as final buyers in the community, as new products are brought to our attention and we, f f we, we turn our attention to those and start to buy those rather than others, the entire structure of the economy, the structure production shifts beneath and, and, and changes so that we are able to buy new things that are produced in new ways, usually at lower prices for better products. That is how our economy is working. Now within this, as it says, there's government involvement. It's not as if the government, um, that there's this private sector out here and it just goes off and does what it likes and there's a government over there. There is this tremendous interaction all the time between governments and the business community. And what governments do is they, they provide regulations, they provide rules, they provide adjudication, they have law courts. Everything that goes on within business is determined in part by the decisions of governments. Now the governments don't tell business what to do, or at least they shouldn't. They shouldn't tell them what price to charge or what to produce unless they want to pay for it. None of that goes on, but what does go on is that governments have some communal representation. They represent the community, and there are certain community standards that are upheld, how to do things, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, and the government involvement is continuous and ongoing, and it's not just a matter of paying taxes. It's a matter of making sure that some kind of communal ethic is observed in how production is, taken, is, is, is undertaken and how, how business is conducted. Now that's what governments are for. That is what we want governments are to be there for. And well, there are some who think that there is a laissez-faire system or that anybody wants a laissez-faire system. Nobody actually would ever feel that the best way to run the economy would to have government not involved at all. Of course government has to be involved and it's the involvement of government but if it knows its own place, um, which many governments do not. But government involvement is an essential part of the process of production. So if you come to this reconfiguring the structure of production, it's changing almost moment by moment. At every minute of the day, different things are happening that are shaping the way the outcomes. Old firms disappear, new firms arrive, existing firms change what they do, and all the time, through the force of competition, there are new, new forms of output being made available to us. And they're being made available to us in improved, in an improved forms, in improved fashions, and often at lower prices in terms of the amount of work we must do to get these goods. So that it's a continuous, continuous evolution and as it says, productive relations are organic. It's not some kind of mechanical fixed in place. It's not like a scaffolding. It is an organic change that goes on. The connections for the production of anything are so dense, they could not possibly be traced. You couldn't possibly know where all the different bits and pieces that originated in making anything, whether it's a shirt or it's a, or a computer or a car or an aircraft, the, density of all the commercial relationships that go on across the economy are impossible to trace. No one knows where they are. Um, and it is these relationships that are spontaneously made. They are not, anybody's not, there's not being designed. They are spontaneously being made by the individuals in place at the enterprise. Um, and that, that, that allows a 
products to, 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 to come into existence, different prices to be charged, and, and, uh, and everything else that, uh, that, that is required to get the outcomes. Now, as it says again, centrally planned economies. Now, you can have, we have these very, well, we live in a very decentralized economy. Individual business people make decisions on what to produce, and they go out and produce it. In contrast, you have the only alternative that anybody has been able to think of in the modern world, a centrally planned economy. You have decisions being made in your capital city, and in that capital city or somewhere there is a planning office, and it determines the three-year plan, the five-year plan. This is what we're going to do over the years ahead. Um, and rather being spontaneous, determined on the ground, it's made from above. It's made by the central planners who put down a network. They put down in advance what we're going to do and who will do what and how much we produced here. And they say, and if you're going to produce this output, you need these inputs. So you have your production of these inputs over here and all this and all this and all this. The things that happen spontaneously in a market economy are instead put in place supposedly in advance. And as it says, these centrally planned economies are always a disaster. They cannot possibly work. They cannot possibly work. Um, no one can possibly know all the things that would be needed to know if you were going to run the economy from the center. You can't know where things are. You can't know what people want. You can't know what they really desire. Even if you could know what they really desire, which you can't, um, you couldn't then know what, which are going to be a scarce resources one year from now, two years from now, even as you are building your plan on what to do a year from now or two years from now, the, underneath it are all the changes going on, all those organic changes going on as different things occur in the world, different resources become either plentiful or scarce. A business on the ground, a, in a market economy, that business can react to the change in prices. A centrally planned economy, which is not built on, 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 on shifting prices and organic relationships, cannot do that. And the result is that a centrally planned economy never, and I mean never, ever creates prosperity. Market economies, on the other hand, as it says, if it says if prosperity and living centers matter, and if they matter to you, then market economies are the only kind that work. They are the only kind that will actually achieve the kind of well-being and high standards of living that we all are desiring. The market responds by changing production decisions that affect conditions, either in the small circle of businesses or in some instances across the entire economy, in fact sometimes across the entire world's economy. The market is of course people. The market, we use this word, but really the market is made up of individuals such as ourselves who actually respond to changes going on out there. Um, higher prices, scarcities, um, new demands, fashions, things go out of fashion, new inventions, we all respond to that and we just sort of drift in different directions and our desires shape the way the business community underneath it, the market economy, will configure itself to, to respond to the things that it thinks we want. And most of the time it gets exactly right. It is people responding to changed circumstances that are dependent on real-time information, not a five-year plan that was put together four years ago, but things that are going on in the economy right this minute that are able to make this economy work. Um, it's this real-time information. Okay, I'm going to now move to a different thing. This is called caterus paribus. Caterus paribus. This is a concept that you need if you're going to understand how economic, economists think about economic issues. And caterus paribus is a Latin phrase. It means all other things being equal. Um, the example I always give, I always give this one because people have trouble following the notion of doing things one at a time. So I say, suppose there's this house. And this house, you know, it has 10, 10 bedrooms, 12 bathrooms, tennis courts, swimming pools, you know, huge, a eh? huge, huge, huge grounds, you know, beautiful, lush green. So I say, okay, so it has a value. 
And then they say, but suppose right across from his house there was this pub, open seven days a week, closed at four in the morning, that played loud music. And I say to you, what would be the effect of this pub across the road from the house on the value of that house? Now most people, now I know there may be others who think otherwise, but most people would see that a pub, seven day a week pub that played loud music seven nights a week would lower the value of the house. And they'd be right. It would lower the value of the house. This is what Cater's Paribus means. Forget about all the bathrooms, forget about the tennis courts, forget about the oceans of grass and whatever. We're just talking about one factor. Cater's Paribus, we say, all other things being equal, if there is a pub across the road from a house that plays loud music seven days a week to four o'clock in the morning, they're going to lower the value of the house. Now, Cater's Paribus just simply is what we say when we want to look at the influence of a single factor, just one factor. So we're trying to isolate that one factor. So we say, Cater's Paribus, all other things being equal, this is the situation. So do not forget the words Cater's Paribus, all other things being equal, because they are going to come back over and again as we discuss various issues where we're trying to look at the single, single factors, what a change in that single factor will have on everything um, together. And then we point out, you see, that this equilibrium is not chaos. You know, that there is this notion of an equilibrium is where we're heading in the economy. And in fact, the reality is that economies seldom, seldom have an equilibrium. They seldom get to a situation where everything is just static. Um, nothing, nothing in an economy of any consequence is ever an equilibrium. But the fact that it's not an equilibrium does not mean that it's chaos. It does not mean that everything is just scattered and anarchy and unrelated. What this equi equilibrium means, this equilibrium means that things are in the process of change, but they're always in the process of change as under the guidance of individuals thinking about what they want and businesses thinking about how they want to make a profit. They're always in moving in the direction of what will contribute to, to, to economic prosperity and welfare. That's how the economies are shaped. But sometimes, and this is important, sometimes the speed of adjustment, the kinds of information that people find they're dealing with in the world, the changes are so large that no one can cope, that things have fallen apart to such a large extent that nobody can keep up. So that most of the time the speed of adjustment is pretty sedate. Everybody knows how to deal with the situation as it confronts them. But sometimes the speed of adjustment is so immensely fast that no way can keep up. And this is what goes on. This is what happens in what we call recessions. A recession is a time when suddenly everything we're familiar with, much of that is falling apart. The uncertainty about the future goes from this amount to this amount. People stop being sure what's going to happen next. And they take a pause and they stop and they think about things and they wait on events. And so what you end up with in these, in these periods of rapid adjustment is that people often enough just wait. And what you end up with is with a recession. So as it says in the next slide, recovery from a recession, from recovery from a downturn. There are no ready answers that can be provided to those affected by what to do. You know, the things have fallen apart. Some people find their business, the, 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 their customers have, have disappeared. There's a big fall in the numbers of people buying for them. The cost of finance, they may have gone up. The, lots of things are going on all at once and they, nobody knows what to do. So what we have is, um, is a situation of large disequilibrium, not just a normal disequilibrium where everybody just adjusts to, this, to the economy as it is in a kind of slow but deliberate way. Here you have a situation where everything is falling apart at once. But the answer still is not that you can do anything because nobody at this stage knows where your economy needs to develop and wants to develop. It's very hard. You need to have a period of time 
where the dust finally settles and people can actually move back in to the uh, to situation where they're actually able again to work out what other people want to buy and what people they will need to hire to, to satisfy those needs and the economy can again pick up. So as it says in the final slide here, recovery and the private sector, because recessions are bound to occur no matter what you do, and there will always be recessions, there is no way you can manage an economy so that at one time or another there will not be a recession. Um, one of the most important reasons why private ownership of the means of production is the optimal means is because you have all of these millions of private sector business people as well as the individual workers in those businesses and the people who become unemployed, all of them thinking individually but given the nature of how economies work, working together, you end up getting a recovery faster, more deliberate, with greater, with greater, with greater um, improvements, faster uh, uh, return to, uh, to full employment than any other way. Owners of businesses, these entrepreneurs, have something personally at stake, and that's the important thing when you're thinking of a private sector versus centrally planned economies or government or uh, government-owned uh, enterprises. Owners have something personally at stake and make the effort to overcome the problems and achieve the best possible outcome given all of the circumstances that they are able to understand. And it may take them a while to work it all out, but ultimately they get there. Anyways, thank you for listening and I, I look forward to talking to you again next time.